Uh, the uh, freedom that our liturgy gives for a little bit of humor every once in a while is absolutely refreshing. And in the spite of this great heat that we're, with, we're uh, besieged with right now, it uh, lightens my heart a little bit to see us being able to laugh as part of a worship service. And uh, laugh in a very, very good way. Well, um, I want to say how much I'm appreciative of all of you for allowing Laura and I to be away for a week this past week. We went to Sandbridge on vacation where I conducted a service at a little chapel there called St. Simon's by the Sea. And it's an open air kind of chapel. It has a roof. And for any of you who have been to Sandbridge, it's directly across from the fire station at the kind of heart of Sandwich, if you will. And uh, we gathered and had a wonderful service on Sunday. And I want to thank Dennis Slem for filling in for, uh, for us here at St. Matthias <coughs> Sunday. In the course of the week away, uh, we brought with us um, our uh, extended family of daughter and son-in-law and two grandchildren, one of whom will be six years of age in uh, August, <clears throat> the other of whom turned three on July 4th. <laughs> now, it was God's timing that she had a birthday on July 4th because she is a little firecracker. <laughs> and when she saw all of the American flags that were at Sandridge for the 4th of July festivities, she said, wow, she said, that must be my birthday flag. <laughs> <laughs> it was wonderful to be with grandchildren. For those of you that have grandchildren, you know exactly what I mean. They come out with the darkest things, and you love them, and at times you hate them as well. <laughs> but when you don't like them as much, you hand them back to their parents. It's a great thing to be a grandparent. It's a great thing to be part of an extended family as well. And I think that must have been something that Jesus felt when uh, early on in his ministry, that is to say his public ministry, he returned to his hometown of Nazareth where he was raised and where he learned the skills of a carpenter probably from his father, Joseph. And all of the people there were looking forward to hearing from him. And as was his custom, he went into the synagogue, Jesus, of course, being Jewish. And he went into the synagogue and was beginning to teach. And he taught with such astounding insight that all of the people of that hometown of his, of Nazareth, were were amazed. They said, where does he get this from? Was he not a carpenter? Where does he get all of these insights into the spirit? Well, it's because he not only was fully human, it's because he's fully divine as well. And those three years of his public ministry, of his teaching, mark the greatest three years in the history of humanity. Humanity has been evolving now for many, many thousands of years, if not millions of years. And those three years that Jesus publicly taught and healed and died remain among the most important three years in the history of human <coughs> civilization. And we're just now beginning to appropriate, I think, some of that wisdom that was contained in Jesus. Some of the sayings, for example, in the Sermon on the Mount, were only now as humanity beginning to unpack. And not just Christians either, but people far beyond the boundaries of even organized religion are seeing Jesus for what he is, which is the Messiah of Christ, the Son of the Anointed One. And so it is that we remember when he went into the synagogue, the people were at first filled with amazement, and then, of course, something else happened to them. 
They questioned, I suppose, his authenticity because they felt insecure themselves. And so they rejected him. And Jesus quoted from a very well-known saying from the Psalms, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own people. And he could do very few miracles there, the scripture says. It's a kind of sad statement about Nazareth and about the people in that synagogue. And uh, Jesus went about after he left Nazareth and began again to teach and to attract crowds and again to heal many people. And he sent out his disciples in his name to go about into the neighboring villages two by two, the scripture says, taking very little with them, living by faith. And they too anointed many that were sick and healed them as well in the name of Jesus. It is certainly a pivotal time in human history, 2,000 years ago now. And we're here as a result of that. We are here because we too experience the power of family when we live as a people of God in faith. That's the challenge, you see, to all of us, to continue to live in faith and to continue <coughs> to believe that there's something about God's Holy Spirit that is alive and active and present in our lives today, in the lives of our families today, in the lives of our parishes, in the lives of our community, in the lives of our nation, and in the lives of our world, and never forget that. We're family at best, united in love. That's the message today's gospel. And I need to say that it's uh, with um, some poignancy that I have to uh, let you know probably the world's worst kept secret, which is that when I turn 65, a year from tomorrow, <coughs> I will retire from St. Matthias. I will have reached that age that my parents perhaps never thought I would reach when I was a teenager. <laughs> Namely, 65, the age that is normally associated in this country with retirement. And it is with some sadness that I announce that. Um, I've been with you a full 12 years, and I look forward to this year ahead. Because over the course of those 12 years, it has been the greatest time in my life in terms of ordained ministry. You are the people and you are the congregation that I love the most deeply and that I find the most rewarding to be with. And together over these past 12 years, we have built St. Matthias into a place where I believe the spirit of the living God dwells. It has been here all along, right from the very beginning when this congregation was founded in the 1970s. But over the past 12 years, you and I and all of the others who have come and gone have built this place into an even better testimony of the power of the living God. Indeed, if you see what I have seen from my perspective, you would have to say that miracles have occurred, and I'm sure they will continue to occur in the future. We'll be very busy this next year. I'll be working with Ned Armstrong and the members of the vestry in order to make sure that there is a, a very good transitional period we will need to call upon and work with diocesan officials. It will go well. I urge you to keep that in your prayers. But I also urge you to use this coming year as I will, with a sense of expanding our ministries even more. The Outreach Commission, for example, has been expanding its scope of ministry 
mightily, even in the past six months. You've been very generous about bringing food for the food pantry, and Linda Hudgens and many others have been great about working with Clark Springs Elementary School. Uh, this coming uh, week, Monday through Thursday, a number of us have volunteered to go to Camp Chenko in order to help renovate <coughs> their conference center there. And it will be a time of work for sure for us, but it will also be a time of great fellowship and a time perhaps when, unlike <coughs> other adult mission trips, we will have time to spend with each other in learning about each other's lives and learning about the power of God in our lives. Later on in this service, Jerry Buckner will be telling you about what's going to transpire not next Sunday, but the following Sunday on July 22nd, when this carpet, which is the original carpet from the church, uh, I believe it's from 1991 or thereabouts, and is held up very well, but it needs to be replaced. And so when it's replaced, and when the carpeting in the commons area is being replaced, we will be worshiping on July 22nd in Morrison Hall. And that, I think, is an exciting opportunity for us to experience the power of the Spirit in a little bit different setting. A little bit different. <clears throat> Still the same general plan, the same general physical facility, but a little bit perhaps more freedom, less hope. And then as the month of August comes, on August 18th, you've no doubt seen the signs. The progressive dinner will take place, and uh, Jill Griffith and uh, many of you have been absolutely hard, hard at work planning for this year's progressive dinner, which will build on the great success of last year's progressive dinner. If you have not yet signed up, by all means sign up for this year, <coughs> August 18th. And if you would like to host a progressive dinner, maybe uh, four, five, six couples at the most at your house, then talk to Jill Griffin. Um, she's been absolutely wonderful about <coughs> organizing this and forming a committee that is having a great deal of fun in many ways in the plan to progress. We will continue to have a great fall and a great winter and spring together. It is, I think, a time when we can all celebrate as a people of God. Celebrate for all that God has brought our way, not just in the past 12 years, but in the past 30-some years. St. Matthias is known throughout the diocese as a very good place to be. And the people of St. Matthias are known as people who pitch in and who roll up their sleeves and help out when it's necessary. This is a healthy place. I want to say that from the get-go, I have experienced a great amount of love from you, and I hope I have given it back, because I do love you. I look forward to this year being with you more than anything else, and by the grace of God, we will all move together. Amen. Amen. Now,